going to go back to a question I asked last week. What is it going to take to get me to sobriety? And, and again, I want to say, if you've, never heard, if you've never been here before, I want you to understand the difference of not using, not using and sobriety. Not using really can be, for at least a period of time, a willpower issue, right? You can, you know, you can white knuckle just about anything for a while. You can prove to four or five people in your life that you're not, you're, you know, you're not as bad as they think you are, right? We, you know, we know how to take that shot. We know we all have, we all have a little bit of an understanding of willpower. That isn't what we're talking about when we talk about sobriety. Sobriety, we're really not talking about not using. We're talking about what do you gain? We're talking about living in peace. We're talking about living in freedom. We're talking about living with joy. We're talking about, and I think this is one we don't talk about a lot, but we're talking about living with confidence. You know, living with confidence. When we're not sober, we don't have any confidence. You know, like our confidence is about, is about like this, right? I mean, we're, we are dreading the next bad thing that's hap- that could happen to us, amen? We're dreading it because we're not sure we're gonna know how to handle it. Matter of fact, we're not really sure we are. And we're not sure what our go-to is gonna be, but whatever our accommodative style is, whatever our, our accommodative choice is, we're probably thinking we're gonna end up going there because we're dreading that next bad thing. What's she gonna say? What's he gonna do? What's gonna happen at work? What is this dinner gonna be like? What is this relationship gonna be like? What's gonna happen next? If you're living, if you're living with someone that's in the middle of um, a chemical compulsion, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? There's a book written for a different reason, but it's called Walking on Eggshells. And that's exactly what that is right, that, that is like, right? You know, like we don't have confidence in how we're gonna handle, um, we really don't have confidence actually in how we're gonna handle adversity. And if we're honest, we don't have any confidence in how we're gonna handle success. You know, like sometimes success is as scary as adversity is, right? Just um, look, there, is, there are a couple of books that have been written now since the lottery has become such a big deal in the United States about people that have won the lottery, right? And what has happened to them after they won the lottery. And it's, it's not a pretty book. You know, like most people cannot handle someone dropping that kind of uh, prosperity or success in their lap. It's like, well, I could. It's like, yeah, probably not. I mean, I, most of us aren't gonna be different than you know, than that profile. So what's it gonna take for me to get to sobriety? And so I wanted to talk about this whole deal of reservations. Now, I don't know how you are, but a lot of people, when they, um, if you're gonna go, let's say you're gonna go on vacation. So you go on vacation, you go there for the first time, right? And you find a nice place to stay and you like it. And you find restaurants that you like because the food is good. Um, Maybe the price is reasonable. You didn't wait three hours. And you go, this is really good. This is a really good restaurant. And then you go, the next time I go to, the next time I go to Orange Beach or I go to Destin or I go to Hilton Head or wherever I'm gonna go, I mean, I'm gonna stay right there. And I'm gonna eat right there because I remember how good it was. It's kind of like, um, you know, I grew up in Cincinnati. And so a famous, a famous thing in Cincinnati is definitely not the NFL. That's how it is. But I mean, it's just definitely not the NFL. You have to be some, I should be in a group with myself for weird people that like follow the Bengals some kind of a way because I still really can't figure out why I do that. Like I'm pretty sure I'll be dead before they ever become important in the NFL. I think that's true. I mean, I'm kind of resigned to that, but then I got to say to myself, why am I still doing it? Well, that's why I'm here in recovery, amen? So (laughs) there's that, but I mean like in Cincinnati, you know, there's, there's this chili, Skyline Chili. You know, it's like famous. Like, you could say to yourself, the only place I really want to eat chili in Cincinnati is Skyline. Well, actually, if I took you to a place called Blue Ash Chili, that's actually, I think, better chili than Skyline Chili. Now, you wouldn't know that unless you had actually gone there. Most people that are like tourists aren't going to take the risk. They're going to go every single time I go to Cincinnati, I'm going to eat Skyline. When people used to, um, people used to ask me all the time like, uh, that, about Hilton Head, well, when you go down there, you know, when you're in Hilton Head, when you were living there, like, where did you eat? So then I go, well, where did you eat? Because I mean, I'm pretty sure your list and my list is it's pretty, pretty 
certain that your list, I didn't go anywhere on your list if, you're, if you went there as a tourist. Because I wouldn't wait the three hours you would. And I don't want to be with all those other people because I was there. And I bet you and I have a completely different list of who, where, where I would go and where you would go. But that person is always going to go to what is familiar to them, what is common to them, right? What is comfortable for them and what they believe, at least for a while, they've had success with, right? Even if, even if they've gone there one time and it wasn't quite as good, well, maybe they were having a bad day, I'll go back. Like me, you know, I would, I would be more inclined to like look for something new, something different, something, something I hadn't heard of before. You know, like in a lot of those cases, that, that would just be me. Like m- most people probably, if they found a hotel they really liked, they're gonna do what? They're gonna go back to that hotel because they really liked it. I, like if I'm going to a city that I've never been to before, or even one I have been to before, the first thing I'm gonna do, this is, if I'm looking for a hotel is, I'm gonna look for the newest hotel I can find. I don't know why I wanna do that, but I just do it. I mean, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna call them up. I'm gonna ask them, hey, when was your hotel built? If they go, it was built in 2015, if the price is decent, I'm probably gonna go. You know, because I wanna try something different, I wanna try something that I haven't been to before, but mostly, when it comes to other parts of my life, I'm not like that at all. Like, I'm gonna go with what's familiar, and so you go to this new place, right, and you make a reservation, and I put up what a reservation looks like. There you go, that one happens to be a Marriott. Some of you, I'm sure, are big Marriott fans, and you go to Marriott because you expect the familiar, right? It's like, I know people that travel every week for a living, and, they're, and some of these people are gonna go, I will only stay in a Marriott. Literally, I will, some of it's for points, but I will only stay in a Marriott. I will only stay in a Hampton Inn. It's like, well, is Jesus only going to the Hampton Inn or what's the deal? Well, you know, it's the only place I go. What happens if the familiar isn't the healthy? Like, what happens if you go to the Hampton Inn because you've always gone to the Hampton Inn and the Hampton Inn on that particular trip, you know, it jacks you up like it betrays you. What happens then? Because that's us, isn't it? We go to what's familiar for us emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and physically until, and we're hard-headed, most of us, we are persuaded that it's not, it's not really doing us any good. We expect the familiar We embrace the familiar, we like it. I mean, I booked the reservation at a place that I know because I know it. It's like, I can talk all day long about the fact that the single biggest barrier to sobriety actually isn't the chemically addictive substance or the brain chemistry that's going on inside of you that just draws you to that compulsion, the biggest single driver of the continuance of a compulsion is a deep feeling of worthlessness on my part. I do not believe that I deserve to be free. I do not believe that I deserve to be sober. I do not believe that I deserve to be loved. I was talking to somebody the other day and she said to me that she had spent 27 years, somebody on the phone, I don't know, 27 years failing her mother. I said, well, how old are you? I'm 27. She goes, there was never one day in my life, I'm convinced there was never one day in my life where my mother thought that that I was worthy of her or worthy of her love and attention or affection. Not one day. And I'm like, so do you understand that the way you feel, the way you are decided that you feel about yourself, do you understand that what sex is causing is it's opening up this gate in your life, it's opening up this gate in your heart, and it's basically saying to the enemy, right, and it's basically saying to any kind of self-destructive behavior, come on in. You should live in my heart, you should live in my soul, because nothing else except stuff that is self-destructive can live there. 
Are you following that? Nothing else except stuff that is self-destructive can live there. There's a reservation that I have in my soul. There's a reservation that I have in my life that says, I know what kind of room I really am supposed to stay in. And I know who stays in my room. And I know that what stays in my room is not healthy, is not free, binds me up all the time, and takes pieces of me, chunks of me on a regular basis. Because that's the way I know myself. That's the reservation I have inside of myself. I mean, maybe there's, you know, it could be a million things. Maybe it wasn't um, a rejection from one of your parents. Maybe it is that, maybe what it is is you've been holding a secret that when you were 13 years old, you had an abortion. And because of the fact that even though that was your choice and you did that and all that, you, you are holding this peace where God has been on you since the day that happened. And God has been pointing his finger at you and God has been accusing you and God has been rejecting you and God has been not loving you because of that decision that you made when you were 13 years old. The thing is though, see, God isn't in that kind of reservations business. The, the way God would do it is, let me show you a new hotel. It's time that I take you by the hand and you and I go to a new room. We're gonna check into a completely different room. Where is it? You've never been there. It isn't even in the same city. We're gonna go to a completely different place. Like the place I'm talking about, this is what God would say. Look at the end of the, book, at the, end of the Bible and there's this part, this, the part Revelation is the name of the book. It is a really confusing book. You're not gonna really understand it. I want you to think of it if you ever read it as looking at pictures, right? Art, well, there's a piece in there that is too good to be true. And God goes, you, wanna, you want me to show you what my reservation for you is gonna be like? We're gonna go to this city. And this is gonna be a city with like really no walls. And there's gonna be a living stream going through the middle of this city. And you and I are gonna walk around in it. And when you walk around in this place with me, you're never gonna feel more loved. You're never gonna feel more worth. You're never gonna feel more cared for. And the city that I wanna take you to, there's gonna be no more pain, no more sadness, no more fear, no more rejection. And no more questioning about what you're worth. That's the city I wanna take you to. Like for us, us going back to what we know, even when it's killing us, there's a, in, even in the Bible, the story shows up. I mean, it's kind of like, makes me, I mean, maybe wonder if I should say this, but I mean, it's sitting there in Proverbs, but you know, the image in Proverbs is, here's us, man. When we're really sick, we do what a dog does. You know, like when a dog gets sick and rejects something that they shouldn't have eaten, which if you have dogs, you know, it's, frequent, right? Relatively frequent. You know, a dog does that. What do they normally do? They go, they eat some grass. That kind of gets them started. Then what do they do? They throw up. Then what do they do? Well, unless you stop them, they go back to where they threw up and they start to take that in again. Isn't that us? We, we get to a point where we get so toxic, we get so toxic that we try to reject what's killing us. But then like we forget and it's kind of like we go right back to it. You know, you, you have a blackout and you go through the hell of a blackout, right? And blackout next day, you, the, you always know you're in a blackout when the people around you are explaining stuff to you and it was so bad that you have to take their word for it that that happened, right? Because you couldn't refute it. Do you know what I'm talking about? You couldn't tell them that that's crap, that didn't happen because if you did tell them that, you wouldn't have known anyway. You're like lying your face off. You don't know. They go, do you realize where you were? Well, yeah, I mean, I know exactly where, this is us. I know exactly where I was, really? Where were you? Well, I mean, I was in Knoxville. Oh. <laughs> and you're like, I will never do that again. I will never do something that self-destructive again. Yes, you will, because the, if the only hotel you know is the one that is sick for you, and if the only place you know to go to is a reservation where you're gonna be more sick, and if the only place you're gonna check into is a place where you're crap, you're worthless, you don't mean anything to anybody, nobody loves you, you have no value, nobody cares about you, and nobody loves you, like it is virtually impossible to get sober 
with that kind of a broken heart, amen? That's why in this room, we're so reckless about talking about the love of Jesus. Because I don't know, like I don't know if, I don't know if you're gonna, I don't know if you're, you should do a step study. I don't know if you will, but I know, you know what? If you do a step study and don't understand the love of Jesus, the step study's not gonna help you. If, you. if you just keep coming and sitting in here and you don't realize that the love of Jesus is for you tonight, this isn't gonna mean a whole lot. This whole deal's not gonna mean a whole lot. Eventually, eventually, you gotta check into a new room where you realize you are worth what God is offering you with freedom. You're worth it. You're not worth it because you say so. You're worth it because Jesus says so. Like, here's the question. The place you're checking into tonight, think about your comfort zone right now. Think about the way you do things Maybe especially when you're under stress. Like when life is rugged for you and you're stressed and you're struggling with something, tell me what your go-to is. I mean, sure, I mean, it could be, it could be your drug of choice, but it could be a lot of other stuff. It could be isolating. It could be a sense of self-loathing. It could be putting yourself into a depressive, a depressive place. You know, it could be downing yourself because that's what you know how to do because that's a tape you've been living with whether you created it or now you keep playing it back. And there's two deals with that. Like there are tapes that people give all of us in our life, right? Everyone's got their tapes. If you start talking about, tell me what you grew up with, what your base emotional life was like when you were growing up. All of us have those tapes. We can get them by looking at schemas. We can do a lot of ways of getting there, but we all have our base tapes. And then I would ask you, now tell me what tapes you're continuing to play all on your own and tell me what tapes you've allowed God to install in you to where you're just listening to God. Are you following me? Like it could be highly, it's highly possible that your mom or your dad or your sister or brother or an ex-wife or someone that molested you, there's a million tapes that you could have in your life right now, tonight, a million pieces of trauma. And they're, I think they're almost all trauma tapes in one form or another, which is why we take trauma so seriously here, but you got a tape, right? And someone gave it to you probably. The question really isn't what tapes, I mean, it's good to know what tapes you've been carrying around. The one, I, well, what I wanna know though is, which ones are you still playing when those people aren't even there? And why are you still playing that same tape when it's you putting the tape in the tape machine? And you're like, Mark, there really aren't tape machines anymore. I'm aware. <laughs> I know. I mean, you see though that, right? You see what I'm saying is like, the question I have is, is your go-to reservation the place where you believe is comfortable for you, even if it's sick, even if it's unbelievably unhealthy? You know, you're in a relationship, right? That relationship is clearly destructive for you. You're not getting, you're not getting any freedom out of it. You're not being built up. You're not growing because of it. Nothing good is coming out of that relationship, right? But you're still in it. Why are you in it? Well, I'm trying to help him. I'm trying to help her. Oh, is your name Jesus? If not, not your job. I mean, that's just not your job. We could change the boundaries class to that title. It would be okay with me. Is your name Jesus? And you know what? Eight out of 10 people in that class would go, I think it is. I think it is. I mean, it's all good to have Jesus, but I mean, I know really better about him. I know better. Like, is your go-to reservation tonight, the thing you count on, even if it's sick, is it life-giving? And is it a risk? Because see, life-giving reservations are always gonna involve a risk. Like if I go, I'm gonna go to this new hotel, I have never been there. Nobody I have known has ever been there. I don't know how it's gonna go. It might be bad, I don't know. I'm taking a risk that I'm gonna try this new thing because it can't be comfortable because I've never been there. Like there's nothing about recovery that's comfortable. <laughs> 
There's nothing about sobriety that's comfortable. There's nothing about sobriety and sober living that is going to be familiar to you. You're not going to recognize it when you see it because most likely you've never had it. Amen. You've never had it. Like most Christians believe that as long as they, as long as they've accepted Jesus, they're, they're living in a sober way. Untrue. Untrue. Yes, you've accepted Jesus. There's a whole nother piece of the book, baby, when we're starting to talk about sober living and how to apply what it means to allow Jesus to love you. See, there are, there are life-giving reservations. Those are the ones that are completely unfamiliar to us and someone else is gonna have to teach us and we're gonna have to have somebody else show us the way because we're not gonna know the way. Even if you put it in your GPS, you're not gonna know the way. And then there are death-giving reservations. The death-giving reservations are the one the enemy is allowing us to make time after time after time. I listen to people go, well, you know, I'm dating this person. I mean, the thing is, I have a type. I'm like, what's your type? Well, they're this and they're this and they're this. And you're like, well, that doesn't sound healthy. I know, that's my type. <laughs> so you're making a reservation to date the same person over and over and over again who you know is not healthy and not freeing for you because that's your type, because you're comfortable with that. That is a death-giving reservation. Continuing, continuing to take on you know, alcohol and drugs when we know that the disease for us, if that's a compulsion of yours, is fatal. It's like there's no asterisk with your name at the bottom of that page. It is fatal. And you go, I'm going to keep doing that because that's the, re that's the reservation I know. Look, that is death-giving reservation. It takes a little bit more out of me every time I check into that room. See, I know the way to that sick place. I know the way to that room where I have a comfort, even if it's killing me. I know how to avoid my trauma. I know how to try to make it go away. I know how to soothe the pain in my life that I'm not talking about. I know how to do that. I can get there to that room in my sleep. But is that a life path? See, like if it was a life path, I would have not known the way to that room. If it was a life path, I would have not known the way to that hotel. Here's the key. I would have had to have been led there. Jesus would have had to lead me there. You know, like, there's not another way to get there. If you could have found your own way there, you would have. The risk of making a reservation for a place I haven't been to is I'm going to have to be led there. That is going to be, for all of us, uncomfortable. That's going to be unfamiliar. That's going to be undone. And that's going to be life-giving. I want you to hear this piece out of the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. There's a whole long story of people in this chapter that risked it with God that by all, all rights and all logic, they should not have. Like every one of these people in, the, in that chapter 11 do reckless things with God and check into rooms they have never been to and God has taken them by the hand. And if you ask them why they did it, when we get to heaven, you say, why'd you do that? Why did you go there, Abraham? He'll, I think what he'll say is, I got so tired of checking in to the same room that kept sucking the life out of me, I finally decided, if nothing else, what did I have to lose? I was going to take God's hand and see where he took me to. Like sometimes to start, it's really got to be like that. So it says, obviously people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. The familiar what I know. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place. A heavenly, he says, a heavenly homeland. Not a death chamber, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city 
for them. That's the city that I was talking about in the beginning. He has prepared a city for them. He has prepared a room for them. You're not going to know where it is. I'm not going to know where it is. He's going to have to take you there. Jesus is fully prepared to do that tonight. But you know what? Eventually, you got to do one of two things. You got to let him take you by the hand and let him walk you out of the room you're currently checked into. And let him say to you, you do count. You are loved. I have sacrificed my life for you. You are priceless for me. You do deserve this freedom. You do deserve sobriety. You do deserve a fullness of life. Or you just got to walk away from what's familiar and let him meet you on the outside of wherever you've been hiding. One of those two things has to happen for us to get free. We're going to open this for an altar. You can come and pray up here. We have a care room right out here if you want to talk about what I've been talking about with somebody more tonight. Thanks so much in Jesus' sweet name. Amen.